Welcome to MOOC's course Mechanical Unit Operations. The title of this particular lecture is Size Enlargement Methods. Till now we have seen the requirement and necessity of the size reduction, how to do the analysis of the size reduction process, what types of size reduction forces are existing, what kind of equipment are available, those things we have seen. We have also seen the storage and conveying of the bulk solids, crushed solids and then lumps as well, those things we have seen. But sometimes it is also necessary to do a kind of size enlargement for a few type of applications. So, so that is the reason this particular module we are going to discuss size enlargement methods and then equipment available for the size enlargement of fine particles. So, before going into the details of the size enlargement methods, first let us discuss about why this size enlargement is required, under what conditions it is having a kind of important role, uh, is it necessary to do always kind of size reduction, what is the like you know in general size of the particles that they should be enlarged, those kind of things we see and then we see the effect of such particles if we do not do the enlargement. So why size enlargement required? Because fine particles we understand that they are very difficult to handle and in bulk they do not flow readily that is what in general we have seen even the previous modules in the storage and conveying section also we have seen if the particles are very fine what happens they may be let us say it is a kind of bean or a kind of hopper is there so then if the particles are very fine they may be sticking to the wall right clinging to the walls in general and they may not be falling down comfortably right when this wall is open at the bottom or sometimes you know they may be forming a kind of bridge just above the uh, this uh, discharge opening they form a kind of bridge such a kind of you know friction they have uh, amongst themselves so they have a kind of bridging so that whatever the material is there below that bridge formation that may be discharged but above that one that will not able to discharge and then this bridging is having such kind of strength so that will not allow the material to flow down. And these kind of issues we have seen and then these kind of issues are very much uh, severe especially for fine particles. Why it happens? Because they have the tendency to other together as conglomerates due to a result of action of their surface forces. They have a uh, surface forces, surface forces come into the picture especially when the particles go goes to towards the smaller and smaller uh, size. Very fine particles, they have a kind of surface forces like you know, they may have the electrostatic charges, they may also have a kind of uh, Van der Waal forces, etc. Those kind of forces, they try to make these particles to come together and then form kind of a conglomerates. Those surface forces are playing a kind of active role and then because of the surface forces, these fine particles, they tend to adhere together to form conglomerates. And then further finer the particles, the greater is the specific surface of the particle. So if the specific surface of the particle is large or the particle is very fine, that means very small size diameter particle, then in general it will take a long time to settle down. Because of that one, you know what happens, this gravitational forces acting on that particle would be very small. Though the gravitational forces whatever they make this particle to settle, so they may not be settled because of let us say this room they may be having several fine particles, dust particles, very very small particles which we were not able to see with naked eyes, but they are suspended. Still the gravity is acting, but the gravity is so small for those particles that they will not be able to settle down or they settle down in infinite time, okay, very large time. So under such conditions what happens? They stay apart from each other during the flow, so then they will not be able to transport it easily. Then uh, what is the uh, remedy? The simplest remedy that one can use a kind of a glidant. The glidant is a kind of external material that, that is a kind of uh, fine powder that forms a kind of a layer amongst the, uh, around these uh, fine particles and then that will reduce the surface forces like even those uh, some of the glidants they also avoid or uh, reduce the electrostatic forces or the strength of electro electrostatic forces so that you know they can flow or they can flow freely if the separation or the flow uh, strength is uh, sufficient enough for, for the flow to occur. So what are these glidants? Glidants are very fine powders which are capable of reducing interparticle friction by forming surface layer on the particles, okay. So let us say we have a kind of a particle, fine particle like this, 
like this. So then this glidens, you know, they form a kind of layer around uh, around this uh, surface of this particle, right? So that you know what happens that whatever the interparticle friction is there between this particle, that will be reduced because of this uh, interfering layer uh, formed because of this uh, you know glidens. So that is the uh, purpose of using this glidens so that this interparticle friction may be reduced. Uh, by forming a layer along the surface of the particles, right? So that the friction arising from surface roughness may be uh, reduced, and then accordingly, the conglomerates of the particle adhering to together, that particular uh, phenomenon may be uh, reduced. Glidens can also reduce effects of electrostatic charge uh, charges as well. So not only the surface uh, forces, other surface uh, forces, you know. Interparti reducing interparticle friction, etc. They also reduce the electrostatic charges as well for such fine particles. But the problem is uh, about this particle, they are uh, much smaller than this uh, finer particle themselves and they are forming a kind of powder layer. They are kind of uh, powder material and then forming a kind of layer. And these materials should have a kind of a similar, if not exactly same as the uh, ingredient material or active ingredient material, let us say whatever the uh, fine particles that we have, we are worried about uh, their transport and handling. Let us say those particles, let us call active ingredients along those, uh, when you take this glidens mix with the active uh, ingredients, uh, solid that is uh, finer particles. So then these glidens are maybe forming a kind of layer, but this glidens should have a similar thermophysical properties as a kind of active ingredients. Right, and then should they should be inert? They should not be reacting, or they should not be causing some kind of uh, other kind of physical changes, if at all. Some temperature uh, uh, is also included in the process. Those kind of thing. And then other important thing is that sometimes you need only active ingredients to be participating in the subsequent processes after the conveying. Let us say, let us say there is a reaction. So before the reaction, these fine particles are very difficult to. Uh, flow. So then you mixed with the glidant and then after using the glidant you are comfortably able to move these particles to the unit process where the reaction is supposed to take place. But the reaction has to be taken place with a fluid, let us say a surrounding fluid, heterogeneous reaction is taking place. That reaction has to be taken place with the active ingredient only, not with the glidant. So in such case, before the reaction you need to separate out those glidants. That is the another uh, additional problem arising with this glidant. One more issue is that you know you may not find a kind of a suitable uh, gliden for all kind of materials. For some kind of material you may find a kind of a suitable gliden, but uh, finding such kind of gliden for all kind of all other kind of materials is a kind of very difficult task. So that is the reason rather uh, trying to find out the gliden, it is better to optimize the size of the particles usable uh, level like you know uh, workable size particles you you try to, make or have a particle sizes of such a kind of large size which can be workable, which can be easily transportable and then which can be easily reactable or uh, undergo some kind of momentum or heat transfer whatever the, if there is a reaction whatever the process are there, so that should uh, comfortably take place, that is what the purpose. So it is better to have the particles of such kind of size, right? Because of this reason, if you can enlarge the fine particles then they may come to the such a kind of a, a certain bigger size uh, size and then those size particles may be comfortably undergo subsequent operations right and then this size enlargement should be very controlled you cannot have a kind of from very fine uh, particles of uh, some microns or some nano size to the almost like you know when you do the enlargement you may be getting to 1 centimeter 2 centimeter particles such kind of big lumps you are forming that should not be the case again it should be controlled process okay so that is the reason optimization of particle size is far most important method of improving the flow properties of solids rather than using the glidens because of the reasons that I mentioned. Now we have also seen that fine particles may be difficult to discharge from hoppers because sometimes they may be clinging to the wall surface of the container and then they may be forming a kind of uh, bridges as I already uh, drawn a picture and shown in a hopper something like this you may be having you know fine particles filled over here so entirely. So then what happens you know the fine particles may be sticking to the walls you may not be able to uh, discharge them properly right like this 
right. So, like these particles may be sticking to the wall sometimes and then sometimes what happens a kind of rat hole formation kind of thing will be there. So, that is the material above that discharge rat hole that may be discharging but the other material may not be discharging because there is a kind of a interparticle friction and then that keeps those particles uh, together like this. So, they are not uh, flowing, right. So, only that material whatever in the rat hole that is only going comfortably. Sometimes we have also seen that you know the kind of a bridge formation takes place like this, like this bridge formation of the particles will take place. So, what happens the material whatever uh, the material solid fine particles below the bridge formation level is there that will be taken down uh, that will that may come comfortably, but the uh, material which is above the uh, bridge you know that may not able to uh, flow down because the particles interparticle friction is so high that the particles are coming gathering together and then forming a kind of bridges and then they are not allowing the material above them whatever is there that to flow down. So, these kind of issues are there so that we have already seen. So, as particles may cling to the walls, particles may form bridges at the point of discharge. So, although these kind of problems we have already seen that if you provide mechanical vibrations or you know shaking mechanical steering or you know vibrations etc along the walls of this container or the silo or the hopper. So, then it is possible that you may you may reduce such kind of effects of bridge formation or you can reduce the influence of the rat hole formation. You may even reduce the particle stinging particles you know stitch or uh, sticking to the wall clinging to the wall those kind of things also you can reduce, but you cannot completely avoid such kind of phenomena by using mechanical vibrations or mechanical steering kind of thing, right. So, because of that one it is always possible to have a kind of a you know solution may be to increase the particle size by forming them into aggregates that is the kind of best solution, best possible if not the best satisfactory solution that is going to be a kind of satisfactory solution where you can conveniently move or the allow uh, you where you conveniently uh, make uh, solid particles to move conveniently or flow conveniently that you can make sure uh, with a kind of satisfactory kind of things if not uh, if not by uh, if it is not a best option it is a kind of satisfactory option. So, increasing the particle size by uh, size enlargement methods is a kind of uh, going to be very useful. However, the problems associated with the fine particles we have seen till till now are only associated with, the, with uh, their flowability kind of issues only. But in general they may also cause some kind of health issues as well that we see now. Fine particles may also give rise to serious environment and health problems. What happens let us say when you are uh, loading or unloading a vehicles which is uh, having like you know uh, these fine particles, let us say fine particles you are loading in a vehicle or you know already fine particles are loaded in a container and then you are uh, taking out, unloading it. Then during that process what happens this uh, fine particles may form a kind of a dust cloud in the surrounding, right. So, that is very dangerous and then surrounding weather if it is in a kind of a windy condition, weather is a windy weather then uh, this dust cloud may be carried to the long distance and then that may be causing health problems to the uh, not only the, the people uh, working in the industry in, uh, in the process, but also nearby surrounding uh, society as well that is going to affect, right. So, that is the problem. So, in such cases what happens even if this uh, fine particles are inert, right. So, uh, when you inhale them even if it is inert that is going to sting on to the lungs and then that may be uh, causing some kind of you know respiratory problems that is a kind of major issue. Now, when they are non-reacting, when they are inert and then when you are inhaling them by you know uh, because the weather is uh, surrounding air is contaminated like that then they are. Uh, sticking to the lungs and then you know uh, creating a respiratory problem. Now, you can imagine if these particles are reactive also, if they may also cause some kind of uh, uh, physical or chemical changes inside the body then uh, you can you cannot even imagine one, what kind of you know health issues uh, you know arise. So, such is the kind of dangerous problem about these fine particles, especially con concerned with the environment and health problems. So, as they may form dust clouds when loaded into the vehicles may become dispersed over the long distance in windy conditions. Even if fine particles are inert, serious respiratory problems can result if they are inhaled. It may be noted that 
particular health hazard imposed by asbestos is largely associated with the size and shape of the particles and their tendency to collect in the lungs. Because of these reasons, these asbestos particles in general which are uh, you know inhaled because of this such kind of environment in the working place, you know, you know they are causing respiratory problem because of their size and shape and then their tendency to collect in the lungs. So, this is other kind of problem of handling a very fine particles. So, size of the particles may be increased from molecular dimensions by growing them by crystallization from both solution and melts. What you can do? You can find out a kind of a solvent in which these uh, particles may be dissolved. So, then you dissolve them and then you recrystallize them. So, that you know this final particle initially you dissolve, but when you do the recrystallization you may not be getting such fine particles, you may be getting such a, uh, you may be getting a slightly bigger particles. Okay? So, dissolving and recrystallizing may provide a mechanism for controlling both particle size and shape as well. So, fine particles may also be condensed out from both vapors and gases uh, before uh, uh, letting out the industrial effluents, let us say industrial effluents, gases or vapors whatever having you know particles or particle laden vapors or gases rather just releasing them from the industries before releasing them one can condense them and then collect a kind of a, a bigger particles and then only cleaner gases or vapors are, should be released out. Desired particle size may also be as achieved by building up from fine particles such as like you know production of fertilizer granules by gra agglomeration or by a repeated coating process. Fertilizers in general we do a kind of agglomeration. The fertilizers also they need a kind of specified size. You cannot have a very fine particle, very small size of the fertilizers because they are in general used in kind of uh, farming etc. So, in the field you know when somebody is spraying the, these uh, you know uh, fertilizers if they are very small and then surround uh, cat catching up in the surrounding air so that is going to be a dangerous uh, to the people working around. So, that way also the fertilizers need to be of a specialized sizes okay. They cannot be very fine par very small very fine par sizes. Then formation of pellets or pails of medical purposes by compression of partic uh, particulate mass. So, sometimes you know especially in uh, pharmaceutical industries we see tabletting etc. Tablets consist of so many several particles. So, we, um, we one cannot uh, take those particles as it is. So, then a kind of briquetting or uh, tabletting is uh, done by the compressive forces, compressive action that is one of the you know size enlargement method that we are going to see anyway. So, here we can have a kind of binding agent uh, you know along with these particles. So, that binding agent will give a strength to the material and then that tablet one can have right. So, uh, this will also add a kind of addition like you know uh, tabletting you know uh, a certain exact how many grams of the material should be present in the given or how many grams or milligrams of the active ingredient should be present in a given tablet those kind of thing controlling and metering can also be done by a uh, exact pelleting or briquetting of these tablets. So, then what is size enlargement? So, we have seen already several reasons why size enlargement should be done there may be many other reasons also right. So, we have now enough number of reason to study why size enlargement uh, is required right. So, first let us see what is size enlargement. It is any process whereby small particles are agglomerated or otherwise brought together into larger relatively permanent masses in which original particles can still be distinguished. Okay? So, that is what like you know when you do this uh, you take a uh, few particles and then you do a kind of agglomeration process so that you can have a kind of bigger particles right bigger size particles you can have um, you know comprising of such small particles. But they should not be very loose that you know when you give a kind of a small forces these particles may be you know these uh, you know enlarged particles may be disintegrating immediately right. But they should not be very strong that if you wanted to disintegrate them then you need to give a kind of a, uh, additional forces extra forces kind of thing ok. They should be relatively permanent masses. Let us say you have taken tablets. So, the particles are a kind of you know uh, active ingredients, but you are adding some kind of binding agent so that you can easily make a kind of a uh, tablet which is having sufficient mechanical strength. 
but if the mechanical strength is so high that when, even when you inhale it, it takes if, uh, several hours to dissolve inside uh, your stomach to, so that the active ingredient should come out and then be active and then show its effect on a kind of a, a disease, so it is not going to work. It should be dissolved, it should be disintegrated as early as possible, so those kind of things are, should be taken care. So that is the reason size enlargement is any process whereby small particles are agglomerated are otherwise brought together into larger relatively permanent masses in which original particles can still be distinguished okay so they they, it is, they should not be very loose also if they are very loose you know you know um, by the from the from the point of production to the consumer point by um, uh, the tree chase you know the, all the particles the the enlarged particles may be disintegrated and then smaller particles may be forming so that is not going to lose either way it should be controlled properly so where do we find uh, such kind of size enlargement in general? We find in pharmaceutical and food processing industries. We find in consumer products specified uh, size and shape of the products are required. So that is what we call consumer products. And in fertilizers and detergent productions, detergents also need to be in a kind of uh, specified sizes. They cannot be very fine. Otherwise, they may cause a kind of uh, environmental and health hazardous to the people using them then mineral processing industries etc uh, where we use in general the size enlargement methods so agglomeration is the formation of aggregates through the sticking together of uh, feed and our recycled material so whatever the material that feed material is there you sticking together and then form a kind of a certain bigger particles that is what agglomeration so now what should be the objectives of size enlargement in general right so let us say in agricultural chemical granules or pharmaceutical tablets, the objective should be they should provide provision of a defined quantity to facilitate dispensing and metering. So in a given size of the tablet, the amount of the active in ingredients and an amount of the binding material, binding agent will be very much defined and then properly controlled. So that provision you will be able to have if you are doing this uh, you know size enlargement and then tableting kind of thing or you should do the size uh, tableting kind of process such a way that in a given tablet you should have a uh, that much milligrams of active ingredients only you cannot afford to have a variation or change in active ingredients composition from one tablet to other tablet so that kind of provision of a defined quantity to facilitate dispensing and meet metering of these uh, tablets etc then improved flowability also. So when they are uh, after farming by some briquetting operation or compressive kind of uh, size enlargement methods, whatever the tablet that you could, uh, bring, you will not be packing immediately in the wrappers. So you may be flowing from one process to the, or the product collection vessel. So the flowability should be comfortable and then during the flow process, they should not break, etc. those kind of things. So that is improved flowability should be there and then creation of non-segregating blends of powder ingredients, briquetting of waste fines such as elimination of dust handling hazards or losses etc. Then granulation of fertilizers to reduce caking and lump formation. In general in fertilizers what happens if the particles are very small so the actually you know the process you know you will be doing some kind of you know drying process also so they uh, if the process is not done properly, a kind of caking or lump formation kind of thing will also be take place in general. So when you do the granulation of these fertilizers, one should be careful that they, sh they are not forming cakes or lump kind of thing or that by size enlargement such a kind of existing caking lump formation should be reduced. And then increased bulk density for storage and tableting of the feeds etc. Then control of solubility in instant food products and so on so like that if you application wise if you see their objectives also keep on changing and then slightly modifying from one to the other case right so these are the objectives with reference to some kind of uh, specific applications of the size enlargement then agglomeration methods so what we understand agglomeration is kind of a sticking together uh, uh, smaller particle fine particles and then try, uh, trying to form a kind of bigger particle right so now how does it happen what kind of methods are available that is what we are going to see primarily uh, there are uh, two methods only but we can have a kind of third method also so we see these three methods like first one is the granulation or agitative agglomeration 
right here agglomeration by agitation is referred to as a kind of granulation here what we have a, you have a kind of a cylindrical vessel where you know our uh, drum kind of thing you are having so in which you take the feed includes like you know active ingredient solid fine particles along with the blend particles etc so those drums rotate once you take this material inside and then the agglomeration or the, you know bigger size particle formation takes place right this process can be continuous or uh, you know uh, batch wise as well so here what happens the mechanism primarily is the agitation so whatever the agglomeration is occurring by agitation is referred to as a kind of a granulation process then sintering agglomeration may also be induced by heat which either leads to controlled sintering of the particles bed or induced sintering or partial melting of a binder component of feed binder components of a feed in general a kind of polymer solutions or or some kind of uh, taste inducing agents or something like that okay that is what the sintering process this third one is the compaction or compressive agglomeration here what happens the processes where the mixture of particulate matter is fed to a compressive de device which promotes agglomeration due to pressure this is in general used for a kind of fabricating or tab tableting kind of thing where you take the fine particles and then you apply compressive forces so that they form a kind of tablets right so either continuous sheets or strands of solid material are produced or some solid form such as briquette or tablets so these are the three agglomeration methods in generally one we, uh, one can take primarily actually two only granulation the other one is the compaction but sometimes sintering is also been uh, used for agglomeration okay then stages in agglomeration rate processes what stages in general you have in general there are four stages are possible four stages can be identified if the agglomerates are forming from a mixture of particles of uniform sizes that is uniform mixture that you have so from that uniform mixture of fine particles if you take and then do a kind of agglomeration so you may get you may find the agglomerates in four stages what are those stages we see now first one is the nucleation in which fresh particles are formed by attrition next is the layering or coating as material is deposited on the surfaces of the nuclei the increasing both the size and total mass of the particles takes place okay a kind of layering or coating of the fine particle will be done by this uh, layering or coating mechanism or this step then is the coalescence coalescence of particles which result in an increase in particle size but not in the total mass of particles whatever these small small size particles are there they come together and then coalesce and then they form a kind of bigger size particle right but the, the size changes the size increases but the total mass of the particle does not change whatever the let us say you take uh, two particles only whatever the weights of individual two particles are there if you add together that should be the weight of the agglomerated uh, bigger particle forming by the coalescence okay sometimes that entire two particles complete material may not be forming a kind of a bigger material so one bigger particle and then some fracture uh, fractures may also for, uh, forming so that entire mass will remain same though the bigger size particles are forming then attrition this results in degradation and formation of small particles thus generating nuclei that re enter the cycle again so those are the you know uh, different stages that one may come across in kind of agglomeration so granulation stages so we have seen till now stages in uh, agglomeration now we see stages in uh, granulation so here uh, we see this kind of pictorially here in a traditional uh, description what we have uh, we have a small nuclei small kind of particles so they join together because of the nucleation and then they form a kind of particle like this let us say that particle is like this and then you have a kind of a binding agent or something like that this small particles here right so these particles will form a kind of a layer along the surface like this or a kind of you know coating will take place so this is known as the coating or layering or snowballing or onion skinning kind of uh, names are given so then you have a particle bigger particle like this then uh, coalescence is also one of the step you know stages so here let us say this one small particle this one a slightly bigger particle they join together and then they form a kind of a bigger particle like this they even come closer and then form a kind of a 
bigger particle like this as well. Then there is also kind of abrasion transfer. So, let us say here now you take uh, two uh, same size particles. So, then in this abrasion transfer what happens? Some of the material goes in and transfer to the other particle. So, then one particle, one of these particle becomes uh, slightly bigger. So, this particle is now slightly bigger compared to this particle, right? So, be because some of this material is transferring to this uh, material by the abrasion, right? So, the obviously the uh, remaining material, uh, the remaining other particle that, sh that, that size should be decreased. So, now you can see this uh, shaded uh, particle, this particle, its size is decreased compared to its previous size before the abrasion transfer. So, this is what the abrasion transfer. Then crushing and layers happening together, slide. here you know the particle is there and this particle may be undergoing a kind of crushing by the attrition or something kind of those kind of processes and then this this will form a kind of a after uh, you know uh, crushing these smaller particles are forming a kind of layer along this uh, you know uh, the other particle so that the altogether bigger particle uh, you know formation takes place because of this enlargement right so these are the steps in general uh, consider in traditional granulation process but nowadays in modern processes it is done slightly different way also. Whatever the small particles nuclei kind of thing fractures are there. So, here wetting and nucleation takes place. So, then some kind of you know solvent you can take or slurry you can take or you know some kind of let us say binding agent you can say. So, that when you mix here so they are forming like this and then further they, these particles may uh, join together with the help of the in the additional uh, fluid medium that you have taken and they may be forming a kind of slightly bigger particle like this, though there may be some smaller particles still remaining, right? So, such kind of bigger particles, then they can consolidate and then coalesce, they can undergo kind of coalesce and then they can form a kind of a bigger particle shown like this. Or this particle, whatever this, uh, you know, after wetting and nucleation or even after consolidation these particles may also undergo some kind of attrition because this process you know uh, def definitely the interaction between the particles will be there. So, then there will be a kind of attrition amongst those particles. So, then because of that one some fraction of this material may be uh, disintegrated and then some small particles are forming. If the attrition is more, so then you know if many smaller particles may be forming like this. So, that is what attrition and breakage. So, these are the granulation stages in general, both uh, traditional approach and then modern approach. Next is the granule uh, growth and then breakage mechanisms in granulation that also we see. This is a kind of mechanism uh, which has been you know taken from a reference book where it was shown as a kind of steps for their optimization problem. This is not uh, truly from kind of experimental work, but optimization problem this is what we have taken right. Okay. So, growth and uh, breakage mechanisms in granulation here, granule uh, growth how it takes place if you have the smaller uh, nuclei something like this and then you uh, allow this nucleation process to take place. So, let us say the particle you may be forming like this. Now, such kind of bigger granules that you have, so you may be having different size of granules. Let us say you have the smaller granule and then uh, bigger granule. So, then they may coalesce and then they may form a kind of further uh, a bigger granule and they are not necessarily kind of uh, spherical and they have been taken in a spherical shape uh, just for a kind of reference so that we can see understand easily here. Okay? So, there is a another process layering. So, let us say a one granule is there, smaller size granule that you form, but there are other nuclei uh, available. So, they may be forming as a kind of uh, uh, layer along this you know surface of uh, this uh, smaller granule and then you can have a kind of layer, layered uh, granules which is having size slightly bigger than the uh, its uh, initial size. So, this can also be layering is also a kind of a uh, granule growth stage mechanism, one of the mechanism. Now, granule breakage mechanism, how does it take place? Let us say you have uh, already granulated uh, bigger uh, size particle, you know, you shatter it then you form a kind of nuclei like this. It is just a kind of reverse of the nucleation process. Then fragmentation, you, let us say you have a kind of bigger size granule. When you do the fragmentation, you can have a kind of two different size uh, you know, granules, uh, different shape and different size granules you may get because of the fragmentation. 
and there may also be a kind of veering. So, when you do this veering, the shape may be re uh, uh, remaining same, but the size reduction takes place because of this one and then so here smaller uh, granule will take uh, form and then al along with this there will be some kind of nuclei will also form. In the abrasion transfer we have already seen, so we one bigger gr uh, granule and one smaller uh, granule is there. So, either of these uh, two process may take place, this smaller uh, granule, some of the material of this uh, smaller granule may transfer to the bigger granule or attach to the bigger granule and then uh, kind of a bigger uh, further bigger uh, granule may be forming because of the abrasion or otherwise the uh, some of the material from the bigger granule may be coming and attaching to the uh, smaller granule because of the abrasion and then there may be a kind of a intermediate size uh, particle may be forming like this. So, here that is what uh, other thing like these fines, the dotted ones whatever shown in this picture are nuclei kind of, they are very very fine small particles, they are very difficult to handle. So, they are not a workable uh, size, they are not in workable size. So, then workable sizes are in general like you know, uh, bigger like you know circles etc are shown here. So, they are working units kind of thing, such kind of uh, enlarged particles are better to handle and then transport. This is about the growth and breakage mechanisms in granulation. Now, we see some details about the agitative granulation or agglomeration and then compressive uh, agglomeration and then those some details we see now here. So, agitative granulation in general we have a kind of a vessel, in general a kind of drum, uh, it may be having disc and then mixer and all those things. So, here let us say you have a feed, this feed is a kind of small size particles, very small size particles but uniform mixture something like this, right, very fine particles. These fine particles along with some kind of binding agents or kind of a size enlargement medium, they will be taken in a kind of process vessel or after taking into the process vessel, you can spray some kind of solvents or slurries uh, onto this uh, bed of particles and then rotate this drum so that to agitation uh, may take place and then because of that one you know because of that agitation these particles you know stick together because of the sprayed uh, slurry or solvent we have whatever which are whichever we have taken because of that one they will attach together themselves and then they form a kind of bigger particle something like this right so which are in a kind of better workable size uh, rather than here this such feed if you see no, uh, the size of the each particle is very small. It is not one feed is not one single particle shown here. It is a kind of uh, having so many fine particles as dotted particles like this here. Right? When you do the agglomeration, they are all forming kind of you know lumps kind of thing, agglomerates kind of thing here. Right? Because of the agitation they have formed, and then this uh, particle is a kind of in a better uh, size to handle in subsequent to op in in a given uh, transport operation. Okay. So, here process variables for the feed let us say x and then for y it is a product let us say y, right. This uh, vessel E is a kind of uh, some kind of process stages that are going down inside this equipment. So, it is a kind of generalized picture only, okay. Here what happens in general, feed is introduced into a vessel along with granulating medium and agitated to get granulated product and this process include fluid bed, pan or disc, drum and then mixer granulators. This also used as a coating operation for controlled release, taste making etc. Then feed typically consists of mixture of solid ingredients that is fine particles or the active ingredients that I have been telling, those fine particles. Then some kind of binders, uh, they are something like uh, polymer solutions or some kind of solvents or some kind of slurries etc diluents may also be there, disintegrants may be there, flow aids may be there, surfactants may be there, wetting agents may be there, lubricants, fillers or end use aids such as colors, taste modifiers etc may also be there. It is not necessary that all of them may be there in each and every process, it is not there, it is not true. Depending on the applications, you know some of them may be there, some of may not be there depending on case to case you may need you know some of them or sometimes you may need all of them. But it is not true that always you need all of them. So, in such processes agglomeration can be induced by several ways. One way is a solvent or slurry can be atomized onto the bed of particles 
that coats either the particles or granule surfaces promoting agglomeration or spray drops can form small nuclei in the case of powder feed that can be subsequently agglomerate or alternatively solvent may induce dissolution and recrystallation in case of soluble particles. If the particles are soluble in a solvent which we have taken then the particle may be dissolved so that a kind of a solutions are slurry it may be forming. That solution or slurry if you recrystallize it then you may be having a kind of a bigger size particle rather having a kind of fine particles as initially that you had. Okay? So, dissolution and recrystallization may also be one kind of a way that is causing this size enlargement. Any of these methods may be possible uh, to have this size enlargement. Slurries often contain the same particulate matter as the dry feed and granules may be formed either completely or partially as the droplets solidify in flight prior to reaching particle bed. Now, this is about the agitative granulation. Now, we see compressive granulation, how to do that one. Compressive granulation in general what we have, we have a kind of a setup like this. So, this let us say two plates are there here, no, not kind of plates, uh, sections are there like this, you know. Okay. So, the fine particle whatever the feed fine particle very small size particles are there, they themselves as individual without any addition may come here may be taken inside this uh, compressive device right and then you apply compressive forces so that they may come together and then form a, a product like a tablet of this, this shape whatever the shapes that we have you know these kind of shapes part, uh, tablets we may get in general. Right? So, sometimes it is not possible if you take only the feed material and do the compressive action if you apply it, is, it may not be possible that you may get the required uh, product size. So, then under such conditions the feed may be added with some kind of uh, binder material or uh, you know taste modifiers etc. as per the requirements and then they pass through this thing. So, when they are passing through this one, these sections, these two sections may come close together because of the compressive forces or when the compressive forces applied and then the enlarged particle which are now product, they may be coming as a kind of product. Now, here you can say here also the initially very fine particles are there, after that you have a kind of particle slightly bigger size which are in a kind of workable size, they can be easily transported, they can be easily you know undergo a reactive process whatever it is there. They can easily be disintegrated as well by dissolving or by applying some small strength without applying high strength. You can apply very less strength and then you can get uh, you know you know disintegrating these products either way. Okay? So, that is they are uh, large masses but relatively permanent masses. They are not uh, you know permanent masses that means you can disintegrate them as well. So, this is about the compressive granulation. Okay? So, now typical agglomeration circuit. If you take any agglomeration section or circuit, there may be several operations involved, several operations involved and then sooner we, we, when we see the schematic, we can understand that whatever the agitative granulation is there or agitative agglomeration is there, that is a kind of intermediate rather than a kind of final product. Whereas, the product that you get from the uh, compressive units that is a kind of a final product. So, that is what we see now here. Let us say typical agglomeration circuit looks like this, not necessarily that uh, this is how each and every agglomeration unit will be there. There may be additions, there may be, there may not be these many units involved in, these many unit operations may not be involved in a given uh, agglomeration circuit or in some other agglomeration unit much more number of uh, unit operations may be involved than shown here. So, anything is possible, but this is uh, just a kind of a typical agglomeration circuit. So, here what we have, we take this uh, feed powders along with the ingredients uh, from the ingredient bins in a blender, in a blender like this here. So, this is rotates, this blender is having kind of you know uh, agitative provision. So, when it rotates the agitations will take place. So, from here uh, you take that material to premix bin and then again add the binding fluid here and then you do a kind of mixing so that granulation takes place. Right? So, so that a kind of a 
granulation takes place. So, after uh, here whatever the material the granulated material is there that you pass through classifier or you pass through a kind of uh, screen screens so that you can separate the undersized oversized material whatever the product that oversized material now here the oversized material should be a kind of product in general because we are doing a kind of a size enlargement they may be taken to the other granule bin from there we may be taking them to a kind of a compressive device where you know tableting may be uh, done by the pressing operation compressive operation and then final products may be coming as a kind of tablets or briquetting whereas the undersized material or the material which are small enough and which may not good enough to undergo kind of you know briquetting or tableting kind of operation they may be taken to the recycle bin from the recycle bin they may be taken again to the mills they may be disintegrated by using the smaller uh, strength mills and then they may be taken back to the kind of a recycling unit where the circuit continues right so this is a kind of uh, typical agglomeration circuit where here now what we are seeing that you know this is a kind of a agitative granulation step here from here to here right so here whatever the product is coming that we are now taking as a kind of a final product after this we are doing a kind of classification or using the classifier classifier in the sense we are doing the size separation so size separation we do and then the uh, particles which are of uh, suitable size they may be taken to the kind of uh, compressive device where the compressive agglomeration takes place in order to get the product in a kind of uh, tablet form whatever the material after the classifier which is not found good enough for the compressive action they are further taken to the recycle bin from the recycle bin they they can be taken in a kind of a small strength mills where these uh, you know particles because after granulation may, they may not be suitable here that's the reason they brought to the recycle bin but they are enlarged they are enlarged so those enlarged particles will again disintegrated using these mills and they will be fed back to the feed powder tanks and then that process continues under until the uh, entire material has been converted uh, as per the required size so what are the growth mechanisms growth mechanisms two essential processes that can cause agglomeration of particles when they are suspended in a fluid rather than a kind of individual solid phase when you suspend these uh, fine particles in a fluid then two essential processes uh, may take place they are nothing but perikinetic processes and then orthokinetic processes right so we see individually perikinetic processes these are attributable to the brownian moment that is you know even when you have a kind of a stationary fluid without any bulk motion so at the molecular level the molecular vibrations interactions molecular rotations etc those kind of things will be there so those kind of uh, vibrations rotations of the molecules induce some kind of a motion that is known as a kind of brownian moment or the brownian motion so these are uh, whatever these uh, perikinetic processes are there they are attributable to brownian moment so they may be existing even if there is no bulk flow though these particles are suspended in a fluid but the fluid is uh, in a kind of stationary position uh, stage so then under such conditions also this perikinetic processes will occur because they are attributed attributable to the brownian moment so they can occur even in a static fluid further double layer repulsive forces and van der waal attractive forces may both operate independently in dispersed systems repulsive forces decrease exponentially with distance across the ionic uh, double layers attractive forces decrease at large distance from uh, the particle surfaces and are inversely proportional to distance fine particles may also be held together by electrostatic forces so now coming to this forces attractive and repulsive forces let us say we have a kind of uh, y axis which indicate the interactive forces interaction forces between these particles and then we have a kind of x axis that indicates a kind of a distance between the particles r so these forces you know uh, repulsive forces are acting like this something like this right so these forces decreases and then decreases may not be a kind of a, it is a kind of this repulsive uh, repulsive forces kind of exponentially decreasing with distance like this
and then let us draw the figure first. So, this, these are the repulsive forces, they are decreasing and then at this point you know what happens, the interaction force becomes 0, there is no interaction between the particles and after that you know when you further increase the distance between these particles then the kind of attractive forces increases up to this uh, point certain r value and then further if you take these uh, particles away from each other so what happens this attraction force started uh, decreasing and then there will not be any kind of attraction forces attraction forces after certain distance this distance is between these two particles and then this part this small this itself the particles are in a kind of you know micron size and then the distance this r is also in small dimensions in some micron size right so this is how this interaction forces in general uh, may be there so under these conditions you know you know where these kind of forces are existing so all those cases under those circumstances we have uh, this uh, perikinetic processes are uh, having a role whereas the orthokinetic processes which are uh, occur where the perikinetic process is supplemented by the action of eddy current which may be set up in stirred vessel or in a flowing system. If the fine particles along with the fluid you may be taking in a kind of a vessel and then stirring them rigorously or you taking or the flow is a kind of very high flow so that you know eddy currents may be forming something similar to the kind of turbulence etc. So under such kind of eddy currents uh, presence uh, the influence of the Brownian moment may be very small or in comparison to this eddy currents which are because occurring because of the rigorous steering or the high velocity flow system. So, in comparison to them, the Brownian moment may be very small. So, when orthokinetic process is dominating, the contribution from the perikinetic process may be very small. Both of them may be there, but the, the contribution may be very small. Let us say if the fluid is almost like a stationary or if it is moving with very very slow velocity, very small velocity something like order of 10 power minus 6 meter per second or 10 power minus 10 meter per second such small velocity. Then there is a bulk flow though it is a very small but uh, the flow is bulk flow is very small under such conditions Brownian moment or the process which is occurring because of the Brownian moment that is more important uh, or having the lead role compared to the bulk motion. Right? So, that is what happens in the perikinetic process. Orthokinetic process it is different way, bulk motion is so strong that the Brownian moment or the contribution from the Brownian moment can be negligible or considerably very small compared to the orthokinetic processes. In such circumstances where the steering of the vessel uh, having this contents of uh, solid and fluid, steering them or the system is in uh, rigorous flow, under such conditions the effects of the perikinetic mechanisms are generally negligible and uh, orthokinetic processes dominate. For uh, perikinetic processes, this uh, size of the particle let us say after time t, if you wanted to increase it to t size, uh, dt size, so then dt cube is equals to a1 plus b1 t that is a uh, suitable equation to represent this uh, perikinetic process uh, in general. For orthokinetic processes you can represent the uh, equation like in equation, these equations are uh, already derived and provided by uh, several researchers and they are available in books. So, for orthokinetic processes they can be written as log of dt by d0 is equals to a2 plus b2 t. This d0 is the initial size of the particle, dt is the enlarged size of the particle after time t. Okay? This a1, b1, a2, b2 are a kind of constants. So, these equations are valid for initial stages of agglomeration only. Otherwise, according to them, if you keep on increasing the time, then indefinitely increase the size of the particles. Okay? So, that is that we do not want. We want size enlargement, but control the size enlargement so that we can use them as a kind of workable units so that we can transport those solids comfortably and then uh, subsequent process may also take place subsequently without any problem in flowability or uh, you know conveying of those particles. Okay? So that is the reason these equations are valid only for initial stages of agglomeration otherwise they would indicate an indefinite increase of size dt with time t. dt is agglomerate size at time t 
dimensions of A1 is in meter cube, A2 dim is dimensionless, uh, B1 is meter cube per uh, second and then B2 is second inverse. These kind of units uh, these constants are having. Then finally, the characteristic time of a size enlargement process. There are uh, different characteristic times are available, but we take two of them which are uh, famously accepted. One Smoluchowski has characterized the suspensions by a half time, half time designated by T, which is defined as the time taken to half the number of original particles in a mono dispersed system. You have a mono dispersed system, let us say 1000 particles you have initially. Right? So, now you are doing the agglomeration so that you know num the number of particles are uh, joining together and then bigger particles are forming. So, obviously, number of particles will reduce though the weight may be remaining same. So, when this 1000 particle number of particles reduce to the 500 number of particles by agglomeration process, how much time it has taken? That is known as the half time and this time is taken as a kind of characteristic time by according to uh, the researchers von Smoluchowski. There is another uh, characteristic time definition, Walton who defined an agglomerating system as one in which more than 10 percent of original number of particles has agglomerated in less than 1000 seconds. You uh, take a, a system very fine particles, let us say again you take you know 1000 number of very fine particles, right. So, if 10 percent of those particles that is 100 particles if they are agglomerating within 1000 seconds, then you can say that system is a kind of agglomerating system according to Walton. And these are a kind of few characteristic definitions, right? So, which may be important in designing of uh, you know these processes, etc. Size enlargement processes, etc. They may be important in designing. Finally, stability of agglomerates. Stability of agglomerates may be increased by mechanical interlocking that may occur between particles in the form of long fibers. In order to increase the strength of the aggregate, often liquid binders are used to fill the pore spaces between the particles. When you let us say, when you take three, four particles, two particles like this, another particle here, another particle here. So, between the particles, the interstitial spaces, whatever are there, those interstitial spaces may be filled by uh, some kind of liquid binders so that the porous space between the particles that can be filled in and that will after drying that will be providing a kind of enough uh, strength for this aggregates. And then amount of binder is obviously function of the interstitial space of the particulate mass. Voidages are interstitial spaces that you can say. So, that how much a binder, what is the amount of binder is required obviously it will be a function of voidage of uh, particulate mass or interstitial spaces of that particulate mass whatever we have taken. Voidage is further strongly influenced by the size distribution and shape of the particles, right? If the particle are you know very small finer size particles then voidage may be small. If you have a kind of a bigger particle or mixed particle kind of thing then voidage may be a large. So, accordingly the shape of the particles you know if you have a spherical particles then voidage may be different. If you have the cylindrical particles then voidage may be different for a same packing height etc. For the same weight of the material, same material, same density but the shape if you change then voidage will the voidage that is going to be formed because of this uh, fine agglomerates is going to be different. That is what we mean by voidage is further strongly influenced by size distribution and shape of particles. Wide size distributions generally lead to close packing requiring smaller amounts of binder. So, you know if you take the wider size distribution of the particles in general then you need a less amount of uh, binders uh, for agglomeration because you know the void space is less or inter interstitial space is less in the case of uh, wide size distribution. So, that is the reason you know um, you may need only small amount of binder if you have a kind of a wide size distribution particles. So, this is this, these are the some details about the agglomeration, why we need the agglomeration, what are the, agglomer, uh, what are the agglomeration methods, uh, how, uh, how to do agglomeration by different types of forces etc. And then typical agglomeration uh, circuit etc. that we have seen, we have also seen the agglomeration stability also we have seen. So, next lecture we will be discussing about the 
equipment available for this size enlargement. The details presented in this uh, lecture primarily are taken from this reference book, Perry's Chemical Engineers Handbook by Green and Perry. Some information is also taken from Unit Operations of Particulate Solids, Theory and Practice, Ortega Rivas. And then Carlson and Richardson's Chemical Engineering, second volume by Richardson and Harker. And then a few details from the Unit Operations of Chemical Engineering by McApp, Smith and Harriet. Other references that may be useful, Transport Processes and Unit Operations by uh, John Coplis and an introduction to chemical engineering by Badger and Banchero. Thank you.